All right, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. What an awesome God we have. And, and I, my, my hope and prayer for this service is that when we walk out of here, we would indeed know him more and seek to know him more and desire to know him more than when we walked in. We are in the second week of a three-week series, um, Rise on Mission. Last week, if you remember, we talked about a, a, a church word called evangelism, which simply means reaching people with the good news of God's love, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we talked about how God's passionate love for lost people, that people who don't know him, people even who rebel against him, people who don't know better, even if they on the outside seem hostile to God, his love for them never wavers. And he just considers them lost. And he will go to great lengths to find them. And he wants to use the church to do it. And this week we're going to talk about another church word called discipleship. And as we do that, as we look into what discipleship is, we're going to dial it back to um, the moment right before Jesus ascended into heaven. He's already died on the cross. He was resurrected. He's been on the earth 40 days. He was witnessed by over 500 people. He is now talking to his disciples in some of his final words to his disciples before ascending into heaven for the final time until his great return. And so the words that he spoke to these people as he left them with instructions should carry great weight because there were some of his final words to his disciples. And Matthew, 18, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, says this, And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This, this verse, of course, is very famous. Many of you have probably heard it or even studied it. It's known as the Great Commission. And the first thing I want to point out about that verse is notice that it says, go and make disciples, not converts. Go and make disciples. In other words, our job isn't simply to introduce people to Jesus so they can make a decision for him, but there, we're, it's to share the love of God with them and introduce them to Jesus so they would follow him, so they would embrace him with their heart and mind and soul, Somehow, I think, when Jesus died on the cross, he had more in mind than just a simple, quick decision. I think he had in mind having people experience and understand that there is a God who created them that desperately loves them, and forgiveness is available to us, and, and what he's done and who he is is worthy of following and living for. And our mission, as, as Jesus spoke, is to make disciples, and, and it's to introduce people to Jesus and show them how that we can live like him, how we can become like him. In Matthew 20 and 10, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Matthew 10, 24 to 25a, Jesus said this, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his his master. The word disciple literally means learner or student. Vine's Dictionary of New Testament Words says it's one who follows another's teaching. It implies discipline. As you can imagine, the word disciple has the same root word as discipline. So not only is a disciple a student who wants to learn about someone, but it's someone who is to follow and adhere to those teachings, who is to immerse themselves in those teachings. A disciple exercises discipline in that we, we get our values from Christ. We learn the truth of what God's word says about who we are and how we relate to God and how he would want us to be and allow him to transform us to be more like Jesus. And that's why the early church, disciples were called Christians, and it's only, only a couple times that that word was even mentioned in the Bible uh, much, far more often, they're referred to as disciples, but Christians more literally means imitators of Christ. 
To be a disciple, then, is to strive to be like Christ. In Romans 8.29, Paul said this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to conform to the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. It's about trying to allow God, it's not about trying, it's about allowing God to transform us so we can be more like his son. And when we examine the lives of early Christians, you know, I don't know if you've ever read Acts chapter 2, but in it is a pretty crazy, um, pretty crazy description of what life was like about Christ followers living together. Acts 2, starting with verse 42, says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a picture. What a picture of community. What a picture of the hearts of the early disciples. You know, I, I look at that form of Christianity and I'm amazed. I'm inspired. I'm inspired to want to to want to be like them. The question I ran across as I was looking at that this week is I wonder what words they would use to describe our form of Christianity. Just wondering. What does Jesus want from his followers? I think three things that we've even mentioned so far. One is I think he wants us to seek to be like him. Two, he wants us to trust, follow, and obey him. And three, given the Great Commission, he wants to invest our lives in helping others be like him and trust, follow, and obey him. So again, the mission, let's look one more time to launch into the rest of the message this morning. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if our charge is to go and make disciples, and that's part of uh, the charge of RISE, M-K-E, is to go and make disciples, it's probably a good idea to um, take a look at what a disciple looks like, right? Probably a good idea to find out what, what does God say a disciple of Christ, a Christ follower should look like. Well, first, a, a, a disciple of Christ abides in the Word of God. You hear us talking about the Word of God often, encouraging you to be in the Bible, to learn the Bible, to learn His Word, because it's so important to, to, in our growth. John, John 8, 31 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. According to Strong's Dictionary of Hebrew and Greek, that word abide has some synonyms. And other valid translations of the word abide would be this. If my, disi my disciples stay in my word, my disciples dwell in my word, my disciples endure in my word, my disciples are present in my word, my disciples remain in my word, my disciples stand in and upon my word. Jesus wants us to immerse ourselves in his word because it is his gift of life to us. It is more than just a book with words. It's just more than a book of philosophies. It is God himself speaking to us. And when we look at, when we open his word, it's an opportunity to open our hearts to hear from him directly through the truth of what, what he's supplied to us through his word. The disciple of Christ abides in the word of God. The disciple of Christ also loves others with the love of Christ. Another aspect of, of being a disciple. We love others with the love of Christ. John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, 
if you have love for one another. Probably a verse you've read before. Do you realize the high bar that Jesus is setting when he says that? Just as I have loved you, so you love one another. How has Jesus loved, loved us? I could, I could sit up here and preach all the way through the Packer-Bear game. And we wouldn't know. In fact, let's do that. We're talking about sacrifice and discipleship. Amen then. Of all the times of saying amen. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. And, and when we talk about uh, Jesus' love for us, are you kidding me? It's, it's a bar that we could never reach, but it's a bar we should always aspire to. How has he loved us? Again, inadequately helped the ways. He's loved us selflessly. He's loved us sacrificially. In fact, he's loved us giving everything by dying on the cross for us sin he accepted us when we aren't acceptable and that's how we're supposed to love one another he accepted us when we aren't acceptable romans 15 7 says accept one another then just as christ accepted you in order to bring praise to god see when we love others like that accepting the unacceptable we bring glory to him because human beings don't do that on our own we decide who to accept and those are the people we love why would we love somebody we don't accept he's saying no when you're transformed by my heart and by my love, you accept people even when they're unacceptable. He forgives every sin we ever committed, and we're called to forgive the sins against us. He was a servant. He was a servant. Do you realize that? Jesus was a servant. I think we have to grab back that heart from God to be servants instead of making our lives wrapped up around us. Do you know that's a huge secret to joy? I think sometimes we think joy is going for the gusto and going, living a life to please us. I need to do some things to please me. I need some me time. I'm, I'm lacking joy, so I need some me time. I love that term. I hate that term. <laughs> some me ter time. John 13, 13 to 17. This is our example. This is our Savior. This is the one who we follow. Here's what it says, John 13. 13 to 17, and this is right before the new commandment, by the way, the new commandment we just looked at, the, the Great Commission. Look at what it says. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, he just got done washing his disciples' feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We're not better than anybody. And we ought not be above serving anybody. In fact, if, if Jesus would wash his disciples' feet, there's no one too low for you and I to serve. There just isn't. And I love the end of that in verse 17. It's one thing to know these things. You're blessed if you do them. In Scripture, there's some great principles that gives us warm fuzzies about how it, things ought to be. We're blessed when we do them, when we do them in our life. I'll just share a quick brief moment from the sideline of the football game yesterday in which Whitewater beat Oshkosh 32-13. to 13. Yes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, we had a, a, a little issue with their quarterback who kept, we, we'd get great pressure on him, and then he would escape the pocket and run down the sidelines and gain yards. That happened a few times. That does not make a defensive line coach very happy, just some insight. If I didn't know that before yesterday, I knew it now. Many of the words, I'm not going to be able to repeat what he said to them. But he was literally screaming to them, and he said, contain, contain, contain. And then one of the players said, yeah, got it. And then he just said, don't, yeah, got it, me, do it, do it. And that's, I think sometimes God would say the same thing to us when we head about serving, don't nod and say, yeah, got it, do it. Let's be servants out there. Let's be servants out there. A disciple is one who wants to become like his teacher. And Jesus telling us, one of the most important ways we can be like him is to love one another the way he loves us. A disciple of Christ abides in the word of God, loves each other, serves each other, 
and another is a disciple of Christ bears much fruit. A disciple of Christ bears much fruit. John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And you'll notice that this says much fruit. Jesus isn't talking about the occasional good deed. Now, now here's what we need to know about bearing fruit. And I think it's important. Anytime we talk about bearing fruit, we're not talking about going and doing a bunch of good things, right? Jesus makes better fruit than we do. Agreed? Jesus makes better fruit than human beings do. So what is our role then? When it says go bear fruit, what is our role in that? I can sum it up in one word. Availability. Availability. Am I continually making myself available to God so he can bear fruit? fruit through my life. You know, because you, you may say, you know, I can't say yes to everything. I can't say yes to every need I see. I can't yet say yes to everything people tell me. No, you aren't, and you shouldn't. You, you ought not say yes to everything. That's not what bearing much fruit means. Bearing much fruit means simply saying yes to God. And sometimes he has you go do things sacrificially and of time, of money, of other things. Sometimes he says no. You're not my answer. He doesn't expect any of us to be the Savior on earth. So yeah, it doesn't mean saying yes to everything. What it means is work on your heart so each day when you get up, say, I'm available to you, God. Lead me. Direct my steps. Bear fruit through me as you lead. Not, not fruit that, that I can go out and do to make myself feel good. Not, not fruit that I can go out and do tasks that help people think, oh, wow, what a great guy. What a great, what a great lady. No. That's not what it's about. It's about making yourself available to him. So being a disciple, total commitment to the teachings of Christ and abiding in his word, having a love for others like Jesus loved us, bearing fruit selflessly by, by serving him and, and making ourselves available to him. And also another one, a disciple lives a life that puts a priority on God's glory. God's glory. Matthew 5, 16 says, The same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When someone notices something good you do, are you in the habit of saying glory to God or at least pointing to God? Are you, are you kind of wanting to take in the praise for yourself? I'm not saying you have to say that phrase every, every single time, but what I'm saying is your heart that people would know you have an amazing God or is your heart that people would think you're amazing because there is a difference. We have an opportunity as we walk in this world to point people to a God who changes their lives. When we steal his glory, we're depriving them of the opportunity of, of coming closer and, and possibly even putting their faith in a God who can change everything for them. You know, next, I'm going to teach more thoroughly next week on, on, uh, in our final Rise on Mission message on, uh, on God's glory. But for now, I'm just going to ask this. Are you living in your life in a way that brings attention and glory to God? Or are you living for your own desires and living in a, such a way that you get all the attention and all the praise? Are you bearing much fruit for God, or are you trying to build up your name? The disciple of Christ abides in the word of God. The disciple of Christ loves others with the love of Christ. A disciple of Christ bears much fruit, and a disciple lives a life that puts a priority on God's glory. But to get a full biblical picture of discipleship, there's another aspect we have to talk about this morning, and that's the cost of discipleship. The cost. There is a cost to discipleship, and Jesus wants us to count it. Luke 14, verses 25 to 33 says this, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? 
Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king is going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. There's a cost to all this. There is a cost. Now, I don't believe Jesus was talking here about showing hate to our family members or friends. He was using something called hyperbole, which is an attention-getting contrast to make a point. But the point is this. Our love for God should be so strong, so overwhelming, that in comparison to our love for God, it's almost like we hate other things. We don't. He teaches us not to have hate in our heart for anyone. He teaches that. He's using hyperbole. But here's what he's saying. I... I love God so much that it's he that's going to dictate my decisions. It's he that's going to set my priorities. It's he that I'm going to follow and listen to no matter what's happening out here. And sometimes that will irritate the people out here. And sometimes we have to choose because you can't please God and can't please even the people closest to you in your life. And he is saying, choose God every time. It may feel like hate to some other people. It's not. God doesn't teach us to hate. But what he's saying is your priority needs to be on God himself and follow him what he says. And you know what he'll cause you to do more often than anything? Love these people and serve these people and humble yourself before these people and wash their feet and extend them grace and forgive them. When you're, when you're following God, people are loved better. But what he's saying is there should be no comparison and who you're trying to please. Because when you're trying to please God, you will be better at everything else you do. Jesus must come first. Luke 9, 59 and 60 says this, To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Sounds harsh. <laughs> Sounds a little harsh. But the man was basically saying, you know what? You're offering me to follow you, but let's wait till my parents grow old and die, and then I can bury them, and then, then I'll follow them. How often have we done that? I'll obey God when this is over, or when we do this. It's a great rationalization for sin. It's a great rationalization for priorities that we'd rather keep. You know, I'll, I'll obey God soon. I'll obey God soon, not, not this moment. He doesn't want soon. He wants us to walk out of here this morning and say, I'm following you, Jesus. There's cost to discipleship. One of the costs that it can cause is personal conflict in our own families because there's times our families have expectations of us that we can't meet and obey God all at the same time. And so it can cause that. And we have to count the cost. What he's saying to us is, it's almost as if he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, it's great. You just heard about all the things. You just heard all the things about loving other people, and it sounds really good, and it sounds like something you want to aspire to. But you need to know there's a cost to it. And you need to know the cost you're going to pay to it might come in the form of other people persecuting you, even people who love you. You'd be surprised when we're sold out for Christ. There's people that, we, that shock us that don't react too well to that. And he's saying, you need to count the cost. And you know why he wants to count the cost? I was thinking about this and praying about this. It's like, Jesus, why is it so important to count the cost? Why don't we just accept you, follow you, and come what may? I think he wants us to count the cost because he needs to know we are the hope of other people in this world. He's the hope, but we are the vehicle that he chooses to, to distribute that hope. And he wants his army of disciples that's charged with the most important mission on earth to persevere and press on when we get persecuted. When we get, when we get taken down by culture and when we get ostracized and we get criticized for being Christians and saying we're, you're ridiculous, you're judgmental, you're old-fashioned, you're homophobic and sexophobic and whatever else, we need to be able 
to stand firm for the truth and persevere because it's he that we're trying to please. We don't hate any of these people. We're simply trying to do what God calls us to do. Luke 9, 23 to 27, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life and lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Denies himself. Takes up his cross daily. Follow me. Are you willing to be all in for Jesus? There's great reward in it. There is great reward in it. Luke 14, 27, again, says, Whoever does not bear my cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is telling us to, to count the cost with the expectation that we be willing to sacrifice and suffer for him. The question you might have is, why would a loving God want me to, want me to suffer or sacrifice? I don't think he wants you to suffer. I think he wants you to be willing to suffer. I don't think he purposes suffering on you, but I think he wants you to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. So why would a loving God want me to even be willing to suffer? Would, would, and I guess a, a better question is, would a loving God, I guess you could even challenge that, would a loving God really require that? But I would, I would go one step further, and I would say that he requires us to suffer for the sake of the gospel because he's a loving God. Because he's a loving God. How and why? Because here's the thing. He died on the cross that people would come to know him. Jesus died on the cross so that people could be forgiven. He died, was buried, rose again, the gospel, giving people hope to have their sins forgiven and to, to have relationship with God himself. Jesus loved lost people. When you had no hope, no hope, he died for you. And you were made aware of the gospel and you were drawn into that and you put your faith in him and now your future is heaven, your presence is Jesus. And when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit now resides in you. He has given you all you need to live a life of love and godliness. He's given you everything you need already, and he is with you every single day. And so he might be saying, yes, we might have to suffer together. Why? Because I am a God of love that has not lost my love for lost people. And, and I may need my people to walk through persecution and suffering to, to get to them so that they may come to know me too. Because you know what, folks? Our future is sealed. We are going to be in heaven forever. We've got the Holy Spirit. If you put your faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit with you every single day, every single moment. You've been given all we need. All of us have been given all we need if we put our faith in Christ. And it's not about me now. It's not about me. It's not about me grabbing gusto and, and doing all the things I can do. It's about other people who don't know Jesus. That's who he died for. He died for all of us. But he also died for those who don't know him yet. He loves lost people so much, he's willing to do anything to reach them. And there's times he knows that this world is going to react in a way against the gospel that's going to try to hinder the church. It's going to try to hinder you and I. It's going to try to hinder the truth. And he wants an army of people willing to stand up to that. And if we have to suffer, we'll suffer as long as more people come to know Jesus Christ. I'm willing to be persecuted as long as more people come to know Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. When this all ends, we're going to be standing before God, and we're going, to, we're going to have our place assured in heaven. And I don't know about you, but I want as many people as possible to come with me. Even if it costs everything, I want as many people as possible to come with me. One more point. God allowed his only begotten son of Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Jesus, his begotten son, allowed him to die on the cross. It's not exactly inconsistent then for him to ask us to suffer, right? It's not exactly inconsistent. 
he allowed his only begotten son to suffer. In one of the greatest twists of all time, God weighs in on a verse we already read. It was, it was back. It's not going to go up on the screen again. But he weighs in with a reward to all this. And he says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, here's the thing. When we talk about cost, and we're talking about giving up everything, the things we're giving up are earthly things. The things we're giving up are inferior to the living water we receive in, in, re, in replacement of that. And, and we will actually gain life itself by, by willing to not hold so tight on the earthly things. I once uh, heard a story of a man who got lost in a desert, and after wandering around for a long time, he came upon a little shack in the distance, and then he noticed there was a well, and he found a water pump and a small jug of water. And there was a note, and the note read this. It said, pour all the water into the top of the pump to prime it. If you do this, you'll get all the water you need. Well, he was thirsty. He was parched. He was lost in a desert. He needed water desperately. And he, he's looking at that note, and he's got to decide. He's got a decision to make, because he has a cup of water. It would be great to drink this right now. That'll buy me a few more hours. I gotta have I gotta have water. If I pour it all out and nothing comes when I pump it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I got I, I don't got much left. So he's got to make a decision. Do I do the do I do the 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 thing that makes the most sense to me and grab all the gusto I can, grab this water and drink it so I'm okay, or do I trust the writer of this note? Boy, I wish I knew who wrote that. I wish I knew about him. I wish I knew who they were. I wish I knew their character and whether they're telling me the truth. And he's trying to decide. This water will buy me some time. He ends up pouring it into the pump, as the note said. Starts pumping. First, nothing happens. Gets a little freaked out. But then he keeps going, and some water comes out, and more water comes out, and more water comes out. And he was able to drink all he wanted. He was able to take a shower. He was able to fill up more jugs. It just kept coming out as he pumped. The note asked then to, for him to fill up the jug for the next person. And he, he, he took all that water, that life-giving water, and he, um, he added to the note and said, please prime the pump. Believe me, it works. We have the same choice to make. Do we hold on to what we have because we don't believe there are better things in store for us? Or do we trust God and give up all we have to give what God promises us? And then once we've experienced that living water, are you willing to make your life that note that says, go ahead, prime the pump, believe me, it works. To close, I just want to, one more thought. Talking about sacrifice, talking about giving it all up. In my heart and mind, I believe the only way that we can give up everything for Jesus and be his disciple is to love him more than anything. Right? To love him. If we love something more than Jesus, we're not going to give it up. We've got to love him more than anything. We've got to find ourselves wanting more and more of him. And if we love Jesus more than anything, then we want to please him. We want to love like he loves. We want to go where he leads us. We want to abide in his word. We want to do all these things. And if we love Jesus more than anything, we want to be like him. We want to be drawn to him. And we are willing to sacrifice and even suffer to be his disciples. Loving him more than anything is what it's all about. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray, God, that you would fill our hearts with a passion to love like Jesus loved, a passion to live like Jesus lived, a passion to serve like Jesus served, and a passion to give as Jesus gives. Lord, Holy Spirit, give us hearts that are willing to sacrifice and even suffer to be your disciple. Lord Jesus, you did the most selfless act possible for us. I just pray, God, 
that you would help us to be willing to sacrifice and suffer so that we might have life, so that others may have life. Help us to be like you. Help us, God, love you more than anything. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.